week's parsha is Parsha's Chaye Sarah. There is a, uh, a custom, not called a custom, but uh, in the yeshivas in Israel and in the seminaries, many of them go spend Shabbos, Parsha's Chaye Sarah, in Hebron. That's a, it's a big thing that they go spend the Shabbos there and. Uh, why is it? Because the purchase of the Mara Samachpela, the purchase of the cave in which Avram and Sarah were buried, it was in Kiryat Arba in, in Hebron, so uh, that, that's so they, basically to show that it's ours. Obviously, it's a very hotly debated uh, issue, and it's one of those places in Eretz Yisrael where you know, I remember we went last year on the Yachikala. We came right off the plane. We got off the plane and we went to Kiryat. We went to Hebron because we wanted to go daven at the Maras Machpela, and it was locked because the it was. I think it was tied to Ramadan. It was it was tied to some Arab uh, holiday, and that's when they have exclusive rights of the place, and Jews aren't allowed in. So it's like uh, you know. You, you know, you travel all the way to Israel, you go all the way there, and you know, can't go in. You know, so it's, it's, uh, I think that's something that, uh, I think what are we going to talk about today, I think we've talked about this in the past, we'll go full circle, but it is very uh, timely in terms of the, what's being contested today, the areas that are being contested today between the uh, Arabs and, and, and the Israelis and the Jews, I think really a lot of it starts in this week's parsha. So we have here the pasuk begins with Avram coming home, discovering that Sarah had passed, and he is eulogizing her. There is a eulogy, and he also is seeking out a place to bury her. Uh, our sages tell us that why did she die? Because someone informed her that Avram was slaughtering their son Yitzchak on Hara Maria, and she found out about it, and the shock is what killed her. So um, I saw an interesting uh, comment that was made by one of the Mefarshim. It says that if in fact, it says Sarah was on a higher level of prophecy than Avram, she was even greater than Avram was. It says Avram was told, anything that Sarah tells you, Shema B'Kola, listen to her voice. She was on a higher level than she than he was. So, the, both of them were there just to promote God's name and, and, and do God's directive. So if God tells Avram to slaughter their child, Avram does it full-heartedly and he does it with uh, all of the right intentions, so why wouldn't Sarah on that level? I mean, she you know, gets shocked and she... Uh, so I saw one of the commenters make a beautiful point. It says that Sarah had these aspirations for Yitzhak. Yitzhak's going to be the patriarch. He's going to be the father of the Jewish people. So she felt, you know, it's, 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 it's great to be able to say that a person gave their life up for the sanctity of God, to die on Kiddush Hashem. It's a much higher level to be able to say, I lived my full life for Kiddush Hashem. So she had in mind that Yitzchak was going to live in a life of Kiddush Hashem, not die for Kiddush Hashem. So that, to her, was the troubling piece that, that, that she couldn't uh, wrap her, her head around. And she, she, and she passes. And the reason we know that it's connected is because the end of last week's parsha is the Akedah, the beginning of this past week's parsha, is the uh, burial of Sarah. So the rabbi has just put two and two together. It must be there's a connection between the Akeda and Saradai. It's also very interesting is that the last thing right after the Akeda is Rivka is born. So it comes out Rivka is born right when Sara dies. And so the Mephorsh and the commentary say that that's the way God runs the world. You know, you take away the soul of a Sara, it has to be replaced. <coughs> replaced with the, the soul of a Rivka. The idea that the souls replace one another. I think that's also very, uh, uh, probably has a lot to do with the naming of why we name after certain people. We want their souls to be replacements and take over. 
for the people that we, uh, we name after. But anyway, so we have here Avram now looking for a place to bury Sarah. So, and this, according to Rav Yonah, there's a, there's, a, there's a disagreement in the, in the commentaries as to what the ten tests that Avram faced. In some way, the last one was the Akeda. Rav Yonah learns is that, no, the last one was the burial of Sarah. And he says that this whole haggling with having to find a place for Sarah, he has to deal with this now. His wife has died. That was a Nisoya. And like, how, how is he going to deal with it? That was like the last of the tests, according to Rav Yonah. But the question really has to be asked is that Avram is a fabulously wealthy person. He's got sheep, he's got cattle. You can't have so much wealth in livestock without having land. So you have to go through all of this to find a property by which to bury Sarah. I mean, okay, you'd like that one, maybe you say, Ruha HaKodesh, that's a good spot. But at the end of the day, okay, you can't get you bury her somewhere else. What, there must be more here to meet the eye about these negotiations for this particular property. What is so unique that he wants to make, that we're making, that, that we have to have this type of negotiation concerning this property, and it doesn't just stop him from just burying her in a backyard somewhere. Uh, make, make his own... Uh, so I think that's something that has to be understood. The, uh, there's a lot of information and verses given to this burial of Sarah, actually almost uh, 20 plus verses that are given to it, which the Ibn Ezra, the Ibn Ezra lived around the 11th century. He asks the question, he says, why do we need to have so much information? Like, you know, we don't have all the details about everything that our forefathers did. Uh, we spoke about it in the past, is that only those things which are pertinent are discussed. So what's the message of having 20 verses concerning the burial of, of, of Sarah? So he says two things. He says, number one, you see from here the incredible importance it, that it is to be buried in the land of Israel. He says, see how important it is to be buried in the land of Israel. And the second thing is, he says, this is the affirmation of God's promise that the land will belong to Avram's descendants. The purchase of this property is the affirmation of that the land will belong to Avram's descendants. That's the Ibn Ezra says. Comes along the Ramban. Ramban is Nachmanides. Ramban was one of the greatest Jewish commentaries on the Torah, a great philosopher. And he says, I have no idea. He says, whatever. He says, I... Eidi Yodeya, he says, I have no time for the Divrei Rabbi Avram. Rabbi Avram Ibn Ezra, he says, I have no idea what he's talking about. And he says, I guess, you want to show me the importance of being buried in the land of Israel? You know, if, let's say, Sarah died in China, and he has to get first-class tickets, and he, has to, and he moves her body, takes her, you see the importance of being buried in Israel. She died in Israel. Wait, should take her out of Israel? Bury her. <laughs> that's the obvious place you're going to be buried. How do you see the importance of being buried in the land of Israel? That's where she died. So he says, I don't understand that at all. He said, and the second point, he says, he says that, what do you mean that this is the, uh, he says, God promised the entire land to the Jewish people, right? not just this spot. And that affirmation happened when Joshua led Bnei Yisrael back 400 years later when they crossed over and they kicked out the 31 Canaanite kings. That's when the affirmation came through. Not now. I mean, this is the affirmation of God's promise that the land is going to be theirs. This is not, that didn't happen now. That's going to happen later, in the 400 years later, when Joshua comes back. He says, I have no idea what the Ibn Ezra is talking about. So as my Roshiv puts it, he says, he says, we know that the Ramba, Maimonides, I mean, he died in 1204. When he left, he left in his will for his son, Rabbi Avram ben Arambam, that don't worry about any of the commentaries in Chumash. The only commentary you need to worry about, I think he makes a comment, Kol Tsarfata Eshlach Lashpata, that like all the commentaries of France throw in the garbage, you know, they, they, something like that. But he says the only commentary that is important to learn is the Ibn Ezra. So interesting, the Rambam said it to his son. So the Ibn Ezra, when he says something, we have to take very seriously what he's saying. But the Ramban, the Nachmanid, is asking really serious questions on him. How do you say that the importance of this week's parsha is that we should learn 
that uh, it's the importance of burial in Israel, and how do you see this as the beginning of the affirmation? So I think that's the question, those are two questions that let's see if we can answer today. Let's go through the storyline. So it says over here that uh, Avram, uh, Sarah lived to be 127 years old, and uh, she died in Kiryas Ar- Arba, which is another name for Hebron, and there it's Canaan, and it was in the land of Canaan, and Avram came to eulogize Sarah and to cry for her. Vayakam Avram al Meso, Avram rose from the presence of his dead, Vayadabra al Bnei Ches Lemor, and he approaches the Bnei Ches, the Bnei Ches of the Hittites, that portion of land that Avram was living in was under the Canaani nation called the Hittites, the Chiti. So Avram approaches them. And he says to them, Ger v'toshav anochi imachem, I am both a ger, is like a, a stranger, right? but I'm also a citizen among you. <clears throat> Rashi says it was a thinly veiled threat, you know. If you deal with me like a stranger and you're not going to acquiesce to what I'm asking, I have rights to this land as well. And I'll, I'll invoke my rights, but if you want to deal with me nicely, I can be a stranger, I can be, a, I can be a, 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 uh, an alien or a stranger. I don't have to be taking my rights as ownership, but, I, but I'd like something from you. What I want? I want to have an achuzas kever, I want a burial site that I can create as my own family site to bury my wife. So they say to them, say, Vayan of Neches as Avram, they answered, responded to him, and they said, uh, you are a prince of God. They knew his name was well. He conquered the four kings. I mean, he was uh, world renowned. And they respected him. And they said, You tell any one of us where it is you want to bury. You know, go to all of our uh, burial sites and any place you want, any plot you want over there, it's yours. Go ahead and bury. Very magnanimous. No one is going to withhold their very sire from you. And Avram stood up and he bowed down again to them and he said, listen. He said, I don't want to go into your own burial sites and bury my mace in your burial sites. What I'd like you to do is that Ephron ben Sohar, Ephron ben Sohar is a member, of Rashi said, Rashi brings down that he became a council member of Bnei Ches that day, right? And I'd like you to put in a good word for me because I want to purchase a specific property from him. And then he goes and starts negotiating with Ephron. Ephron says the same thing. It's yours, free, no charge. Ephron says, I don't want it to be free. I want to pay for it. Right, okay, fine, it's 400 shekel. At the end, he ends up charging him 400 shekel over La Socher. Over La Socher, Rashi says, it's money that is accepted any, anywhere. It's international currency. It's actually hundred times, hundreds of times more worth, valued as to what the property actually was worth. Rashi says that that kind of currency brings down is the same thing when David HaMelech purchased from Aravna the uh, East Jerusalem, the place where they're going to build the Beis HaMikdash, his son, Shlomo, built the Beis HaMikdash, he purchased it also with that type of currency. Interesting information. So we have over here, Bnei Ches want to give it to Avram for free and say whatever you want. He says, no, I'd like a specific... Per- uh, Ephron wants to give it to Avram for free. He doesn't want it from him for free either. He wants to charge. Once he ends up charging him, he gouges him. But the type of coinage that is used is this over the socher money that is, again, why is that important information to know what kind of currency was used? I mean, that's, that's, that's interesting. Even, you know, even the amount, who cares? You know, it's, and the other thing is, again, they must have made thousands of purchases in their lifetime. Again, there's only a few that are highlighted. We have to understand why this is being highlighted. Let's ask, uh, uh, from, Rashi again brings down that on that day, his Ephron Yoshev, Rashi brings down, the word Yoshev is written without the Vav, is because he was appointed to be on the council. Because Rashi says that when Avram is going to be dealing with somebody, yeah, he shouldn't be dealing with just a little uh, shlamazel. I mean, he's somewhat of authority, someone's part of the council. That his negotiations and when he purchases should be from somebody of status. 
Now, Avram goes and buys a Slurpee at 7-Eleven. Does that mean the guy behind the thing had to become a council member of uh, the Valley Village at that day? I mean, what every negotiation Avram had, God made a miracle that the person who came... Uh, what, is, what does that mean? Because he was going to have to negotiate with him. He buys a pound of tomatoes. Then the, the guy he sells him has to be... Obviously, there's more to that, that he had to be made into a council member on that particular day. Um... The Pasuk says that when Avram purchased it, it says Vayakam, Vayakam, that it was established, it went from Ephron to becoming Avrons. It's Rashi says Tekuma, it was elevated. Now, <coughs> what was the elevation? So it was like more, it was like a status elevation. It's gone from Ephron, now it's becoming Avrons. So if I would ask you to fill in the blanks, it went from Ephron, who was a blank, to Avram, who was a blank. So what would we think to put in in showing the elevation of the land? What would the right descriptions be? From a what to a what? Going to a Jew? Yeah, that's right. From a non-Jew to a Jew, maybe. The, the Medrash actually says from a tzaddik, from a Russia, from a wicked person to a tzaddik. To a tzaddik. Rashi says no. He said it went from a common person to the hands of a king. That's a very strange one. If we're going to describe it, why would that be the description, going from a commoner to the hands of a king? It's difficult to understand why that would be the way we, we describe it. So let's just cut, cut, uh, uh, review here. Number one, Avram has lots of property. If Avram has lots of property, why does he need this specific property? Why does he have the headache? Why does he have to... Uh, uh, let him just go bury, the, bury uh, Sarah in one of his own properties. Number two is that why do we even have to know anything about the sale itself? So we have the Ibn Ezra makes a statement because it sees there are two very important critical pieces that we see from here. Number one, what do we see? The importance of being buried in the land of Israel. And number two, this is the affirmation of God's promise that the land will belong to you and your children. The Ramban has two very difficult problems with that. Number one, she died there. Where else should she be buried? And number two, the affirmation didn't happen right here. The affirmation happens when they came in the times of uh, Yeshua. When they came, that's 400 years later. What does it mean? Because God promised the whole land, not just this piece of property. That happened then, when not, not now what's going on. Also, uh, why does it have to tell us that the land went from the hands of a commoner to the hands of a king? Why is that the... Why do we have to know that it was international currency? Also, you know, it's not clear what all the negotiations. The, the pastor keeps saying is that he's talking to Ephron and the people of Ches are there. The Ene Bnei Ches, in front of the people. Why do we have to bring in the Bnei, people of Bnei Ches? Just say, Avram is dealing with Ephron. Ephron is the owner of the land. He keeps saying, under the supervision of the people of Bnei Ches. And the Bnei Ches were present. You know, if he's buying it from Bnei Ches, but he's not buying it from the Bnei Ches, he's buying it from Ephron. Why do we keep having to bring in the Bnei Ches? Okay, because we wanted them to put in a good word. But that's also information that seems to be not pertinent to, the, uh, t- to what's going on. <coughs> so let me share with you, this is just a, I think a, a brilliant insight that I heard from my Roshiva. When you read through the Pesukim, you'll see how you go through with the Rashis, how it fits so well. Any of us that purchase a house, you purchase a house in the United States today, right? It's part of you're lucky enough to be able to afford purchasing a house. So initially, you're sharing ownership with the bank right? because the, you have a mortgage. But even when you be, you're able to pay off the mortgage, do you truly own that piece of property? Why don't you truly own the property? Because the there's, there's gov- it's, it's owned by the government. The government can tell you what color fence you should have and what, how wide your driveway has to be, and you have to get permission to build a second floor. And uh, you know, uh, there's, there's rules and regulations that you are subject to. If anything, really, land ownership that you have, and this is the true with every municipality, is more like a long-term lease. There is a, a law of the right of eminent domain. What's the right of eminent domain? The government have the right to come over to you and say, we want to build, the 405 is, is, too, too, is too narrow, we want to go through your living room. All right? 
and they can take it away from you. Yes, they might have to pay you fair market value, but you can't stop them from doing it because it's owned by the government. The government owns your property. And therefore, 99.9% of all transactions that occur historically are just the rights of long, it's long-term lease. So it's a long-term lease. It's interesting, in Israel today, there, when they, the Kerem Kayemet, when they were purchasing up a lot of the lands, when they sell it, sell it they sell with 99-year leases. It goes back to them after 99 years, and then it, go, it reverts again. But they're, it's the same idea, basically, you don't own it. It's, there are a couple of exceptions of land transactions that supersede this type of transaction. We've had in history, right? Let's go through the, see how much of you remember our elementary, middle school uh, schooling. The Louisiana Purchase, right? What was the Louisiana Purchase? That was between two governments. United States purchased Louisiana from the French. So we have the French Quarter. That's the, uh, that's where it came, right? They purchased Louisiana. You have Alaska. The purchase of Alaska, that was exchanged between Russia. I'm sure they're not too happy about that purchase right now. They gave up a lot of oil. It was a, but anyway, right? that was purchased. That was a governmental purchase. That was, it was called a sovereign purchase because the land changed sovereignty in the type of purchase that went from being Russian land to being an American prop, piece of property. So you have certain types of transactions that are not just within the municipality, but actually change sovereignty of who owns the land. What's interesting is that usually the consideration, the money that's used in, that, in all, almost always, when you're dealing with sovereign acquisitions, what do they use? No, no, they use gold. Gold. Gold's used. Because that's international currency. That's something that is accepted. Because you can't use the currency of, of either one party. So what you do is you use something that's accepted by all parties. You use something that is international. That's what they go ahead and do. What we're going to have here in this week's parsha, this purchase that Avram Avinu is doing, is not a standard purchase to get a piece of property. He has property. Right? The problem is that his property is subject to the governmental regulations of the children of Ches. He owns a piece of Ches. What Avram is trying to do here, what's he trying to do? He is trying to make this property no longer be under the sovereignty of Ches, but he wants it to become under Jewish sovereignty. He wants to make it that it's owned by him. Now, if that's the case, there's actually two acquisitions that need to be made. Why do you need two acquisitions? Because you have to acquire it from the person who has the property, but that's not sufficient, because Ephron has the property, but that's not going to be enough. What does he also have to do? He has to have a governmental transaction. God helps him out. What does God do? He elevates Ephron that he now is part of the city council. So Ephron really, the transaction from Ephron now can be representing Ephron's own personal stake, but also he's now representing the Bnei Ches. So now you don't have a situation, you know, the question was every time he goes and buy, buys tomatoes, the person becomes a part of the city council? No, no. It has to happen here to avoid Avram having to deal with multiple transactions in order to be able to be a one-stop shopping that he'll be able to purchase from Ephron and Ephron can also represent Bnei Ches. He's made part of the city council for that particular day. Why is this so important to Avram? Because Avram wants to bury sorrow in Holy Land. He wants to bury her in Eretz Yisrael. The problem is right now it's not Eretz Yisrael. What is it right now? No. It's Eretz Canaan. 
Avram wants to elevate this, that this should be considered to be a piece of Eretz Yisrael, that he can bury Sarah in Eretz Yisrael. Therefore, he has to make this, he has to make this transaction, he has to do it in such a way that it's going to become a part of Eretz Yisrael. So, let's go back now and, and answer most of the questions. Number one, why is he not using his own property? We understand. Because that would still be a Canaanite land. That would not be Eretz Yisrael. He needs to get a sovereign purchase happening here. Number two, we need to have the Pnei Ches involved, as well as Ephron. Okay, why are they keeping... The, because this is not just a transaction between Ephron's property and Avram. You're also trying to transfer the property from Bnei Ches to becoming Avram land. And that needs their involvement because it is a sovereign purchase. That's what has to happen. Number four, the kind of money that's used. Rashi emphasizes it's over la socha, that it is money on skabal kol makom. It's, it's international currency. It has to be that kind of money because you're having a sovereign purchase. You need to use something that is accepted at a currency on, from both parties. That's the what else we had? What other questions do we have over here? Um, do we take care of most of the questions there as well? Okay, let's deal with the Ibn Ezra's, the Ramban's questions on the Ibn Ezra. So Ramban asked an Ibn Ezra, she died there. How do you see the importance of being buried in Eretz Yisrael? That's where she died. So that's not a question anymore. Why is that not a question? Where did she die? In Eretz In Eretz Canaan. Avram goes through all of this to make it Eretz Yisrael. So you do have a proof from here that the importance of being buried in Eretz Yisrael. That's all. Avram's trying to change the status of the land from being Eretz Canaan to Eretz Yisrael. You see the importance of it. So that, the, la- the last question we just have to understand is that if in fact they're going to get the land 400 years later, that's a, so how's this, what's the significance of purchasing this property and making this property specifically the land of, uh, and the Torah is highlighting it as well. So there is a phenomenal medrash. You take a look at this written 2,000 years ago, and it's just so timely. The medrash points out, this is in Parshas Vayishlach, that when, it says when Yaakov Avinu came to Hebron, when Yaakov, um, when he came to Shechem, I'm sorry, when he came to Shechem, he purchased the property from them. It says that he purchased it, and he made his own currency, and the Medrash says that there are three times, over there, the three times where the Torah highlights acquisitions of property. One is here by Avram Avinu, there is by Yaakov Avinu, and then when David Amelech, like we saw, when he purchased East Jerusalem for the Beis Hamikdash from Aravna. Listen to the word of the Medrash. The Medrash says, why does the Torah highlight these three transactions? So the Medrash, uh, the, first of all, these three transactions all had international currency, which what we're explaining right now, they weren't just regular purchases. These were also sovereign purchases. It went from the, the Yevusite land of, uh, of uh, what's his name? Uh, Aravna to the to, to, to land of David Melech. Right, Yaakov went from Shechem land to becoming Jewish land. Why these three places? Listen to what the Medrash says. The Medrash says because these are the three places that in the future of the Jewish people are going to be the most contested as to whether they own these properties. And the Torah wants to highlight the Jewish ownership of these properties. Let's go through them. You have Kirit Arba Chevron. Right? There are a few hundred Jews living there, thousands, tens of thousands. That's the, one of the most contested pieces of property. You have Kever Yosef Shechem, which is also extremely contested. They claim that that's theirs. And the, most high, the highest contested piece of property is Jerusalem. East Jerusalem, Makam Amikdash. Says the Medrash 2,000 years ago. These three areas are going to be, the, the non-Jews are going to say that the Jews defrauded them and stole it from them. The Torah wants to highlight that these three properties belong to Jews. And that's why these three acquisitions, sovereign acquisitions, are put into play that we should feel, no, we at least should know, is 
Unfortunately, many Jews over there that feel, you know, oh, let's give it back, it belongs to them. No, we, as Jews, have to realize this is our property. It belongs to us. It was purchased thousands of years ago. This is our property. This is ours. So it's an unbelievable medrash. But anyway, the point is that this is not just picking any random incident. This is an incident that's pretty much a sovereign purchase. This land is becoming now Jewish-owned land because Sarah needs to be buried there, the importance of being buried in Eretz Yisrael. This is the first sovereign piece of property that becomes Jewish land, even before Yeshua comes in. Abraham's putting that into play. It could also be like my Sa'ava similar Banim, that the forefathers put something into play to ensure that it's going to be understood that way for the future as well. That's what Abraham Avinu is about, is doing, and Yaakov does the same thing, and David Amelech does the same thing as well. Have a good day.